Thank you, Kirsten, for that introduction, and welcome everyone to our How RPMA Works webinar, our second webinar. We're very excited to host it today and hope that you all gain a lot of information about how RPMA works and why it's so innovative and how it can enable your company to connect devices. A little bit about our company. We are Ingenu, and we are headquartered in sunny San Diego, and we were founded back in 2008 by some engineers from Qualcomm who saw the need to connect sensors wirelessly. And of course, they had expertise in that area and saw that there were unique ways they could address that need. And so they founded this company, and the rest is history. We currently employ about 100 people uh, all over the world. And we have quite the leadership. And we, we are very proud of, of who is on our board and who advises us and who leads our company. You'll see on the top left there, uh, that gentleman is Andrew Viterbi, who is a co-founder of Qualcomm and the inventor of the Viterbi algorithm. So if you were to Google the Viterbi, you would find quite a bit of information on it. And, and I'm sure many of you listening have used the Viterbi algorithm in, in uh, various ways. So um, he is uh, someone, and also he's a very kind gentleman. Next to him on the right is Ivan Seidenberg. Uh, who was the CEO when Verizon was formed, and he led it over a decade until he retired, and he's on our board. On the, the bottom left corner is our uh, the, the chairman of our board, Richard Lynch, and he was the CTO of Verizon. And then the bottom right is John Horn, our current CEO, and a real pioneer in machine-to-machine -machine communication. Uh, he helped form that group at T-Mobile, and uh, also created and uh, was successful in, in this space for some number of years. And so we're, we, we have a lot of industry experience and um, have used that to help uh, make Ingenue what it is today, and, and uh, they continue to guide us. So we're pleased to have them. We're also pleased with the customers that we've been able to serve and who have helped us to really hone our technology. Uh, many of these customers you'll recognize yourself. Um, and, and they, over the years, have really brought us a lot of real-world challenges and that we, we needed to meet and uh, help make RPMA the real innovation-packed wireless technology that it is today. Um, so we're pleased to continue to serve them and to move forward and uh, serve the customers that we are, we are uh, continuing to gain. So uh, the, the discussion today is on RPMA, and you'll see that we have 32, 32 unique patents um, with, with more on the way, and um, it really is truly an innovation-packed uh, technology. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the LPWA space and how RPMA fits into that space, just, just so you know, can I have a little bit of context. I won't go into great detail about the, uh, the other players in the space, but just so you know where we fit in and, uh, and how uh, we differentiate ourselves. Um, so it's important to understand that the kind of connectivity, machine connectivity that exists today will change in the future. So right now you'll see that about 76% of the uh, connections, M to M connections per month use less than a megabyte, 86% uh, less than three megabytes. And so the vast majority already of, of M, M, M to M connections already use uh, very little data per month. Um, but what's projected for tomorrow in this LPWA space, which is, so this space, the LPWA space, which is low power, wide area, is projected to have about 80% of the market for M to M connections in, you know, by uh, 2030. Okay, so that's, that's a ways in the future, but the point is it's supposed to be the vast majority of connections. And within this space, the connections are going to look like you see on the right side here. Uh, so about 77% uh, or roughly 80% of those connections will be less than 15 kilobytes a month. I mean, even even all, all of the LPW connections are, are projected to be less than 300 kilobytes a month. That's just not a lot of data. And so it shows you the very unique kind of data models that these devices will have. They're sensors collecting data, sending it in. Um, and so they won't have great uh, data needs as far as throughput, but they will have other needs such as longevity. And that's really the, the next driver of the Internet of Things is being able to uh, affordably connect and and do so over very long periods of time to really drive the ROI 
to allow for uh, savings that aren't ginormous. Right now, on the left side, most of these connections are um, serving higher ROI applications. But the future of the Internet of Things will be starting to get that long tail set of, of connections. So where does RPMA fit into the various transmission technologies that are used to connect these devices? Well, uh, if you see on the top left, these are, these are just little pictures that are symbolic of the various technologies. You recognize that they're not uh, completely technically accurate. That's not the point. The point is that these are just, it, this is just showing there are different technologies that are fundamentally different um, to address these IoT connections. So we are direct sequence spread spectrum. Um, and uh, it, what it essentially does is it spreads the transmitted signal uh, into the noise, essentially, uh, by multiplying it by some sort of some pseudo-random code. Um, and, and uh, you know, that's what RPMA uses. On the bottom, you see two different variations of narrow band. And what that means is it's just a, it is a narrow uh, band of uh, channel. And LoRa uses a, a chirp modulation. It, it, it isn't... Uh, um, it, it's got some unique uh, things about it that are, uh, try to get a little bit more uh, robustness out of the signal. Um, in the end, it, it, it doesn't do uh, a whole lot, but uh, it, it does help some. And, and we've got some white papers to help discuss that. But um, it, it simply is a narrowband chirp uh, modulation scheme. And on the bottom right is six boxes, which is the simplest of all of them, um, frequency hopping on narrowband channels. That's pretty much it. Uh, and then in the top right, you'll see that there are lots of different cellular. LTEM being, of course, based on LTE um, technology, scaled down a bit. Uh, it's still a ways off, right? The, the ink is barely dried on the paper for the standard. Um, it does use the OFDM modulation scheme, um, the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Um, but there are others as well that we don't depict pictorially here. Uh, ECGSM, of course, is going to be different, CAT0, CAT1, MBIOT. So the LPWA designation really has to be earned, uh, and, and it's earned by showing that the technology can truly support low power over very long periods of time uh, and can provide low-cost connectivity. And that's the value proposition of, of LPWA, and, and really what's going to unlock the, the next generation of devices on the IoT, because they will need uh, the ability to connect without having truck rolls. So, um, the, and, and the way that RPMA, one way that RPMA allows for low-cost connectivity is through the use of unlicensed spectrum. Spectrum is very expensive, and uh, the cellular solutions um, pay, there's an auction, I believe it was last year, and they paid one point, just under $1.6 billion for 20 megahertz of bandwidth. And, uh, you know, that's no surprise to anyone in the industry, but it just goes to, to really emphasize the fact that Spectrum is not cheap, and uh, you know it, it's essentially another infrastructure cost, uh, which which really drive, uh, to a large degree, some of the costs of, of uh, the service. So, um, our spectrum we use the 2.4 gigahertz band. Uh, the other unlicensed spectrum that's often discussed in the space is the 900 megahertz band, uh, and and the first thing that many uh, people discuss when comparing these two is propagation loss, uh, and, and it is greater in the 2.4 band, but that's really easily overcome by antenna diversity, so just having a couple of antennas. Um, and what's really great about the 2.4 band is we can have two band or two antennas while still maintaining a very small form factor, just by the, the, the size of the wave itself. Um, whereas the 900 band, you can't actually achieve the same small form factor uh, like you can in the 2.4 band. Um, so while well, of course you can have antenna diversity in 900 megahertz, uh, you can't do it with the same small form factor. So uh, in a lot of ways, that antenna diversity really overcomes the propagation loss issue. And so we're sort of back at, at, uh, at neutral. Um, and then when you're implementing a public uh, uh, LPWA network like we are in the machine network, it really comes down to government regulations. That's, that's where the limitations come in. Uh, for performance in an unlicensed band. Um, and, and, and this is where RPMA really hits all the sweet spots. So I won't go through every single little thing, but uh, I'll just show you know, the RPMA can, can broadcast at the highest power um, 
in between the two uh, bands and over the largest bandwidth in both S FCC domains and SC domains. So, you know, SCC being America and some other, the United States and some others, and SC being Europe. Um, we also don't have any, because RPMA uses uh, direct sequence spread spectrum, we don't have any processing gain limitations, um, which is very good and, and helps to provide a lot more uh, robustness in the, in the transmission. Uh, narrowband, however, does suffer from severe transmit limits in the FCC. Um, so a 400 millisecond transmit time limit uh, is not very long. And then in Europe, uh, it is severely limited, the 900 band that is, or narrow band, uh, and, and the 900 band is, is severely limited by the duty cycle, so less than 1%. So you can be on uh, only the maximum 1% of the time, and then 99% of the time you cannot transmit. So that is, that is a serious limitation uh, in, in terms of performance and, and capacity. And of course the, the 2.4 band has 80 megahertz of bandwidth, and that is available worldwide. Uh, all over the world, as opposed to the 900 band, where, where uh, it has you know the 868 and the 915 in the United States and, and Europe, um, and then in the rest of the world it, it varies. You know it could be the 400 band or, or some other 700 band. So so it doesn't really have truly worldwide coverage in, in one band. So RPMA really leverages all of the advantages that 2.4 offers uh, while overcoming any of the, the shortcomings, and and it, that's really how we've been able to get. Uh, coverage in over 20 countries and and uh, uh, almost all the continents that w without really uh, any trouble. So, uh, and and we are uh, certified in in uh, all over the world. So, um, I'm, I'm going to start getting into the actual innovation behind RPMA. So, how it works and 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 um, yeah, what it is that makes it such a, a, a powerful and innovative solution. And it really requires innovation at at every level of the technology. So the, the interdependence between the physical layer and the Mac uh, or the firmware and, and then the network is, is a real thing and, and you can't um, you can't just grab a, a Phi and then throw a Mac on it and then think it's going to be uh, the, the optimal performance. Um, it really requires uh, some good engineering and integration between all of the different layers and that's what we've what we've done over the years. Um, you know, and, and and we've gotten a lot of real-world customer feedback that have helped us to hone these things. And and honestly, just uh, performance in the field, you learn things in the field having deployed actual uh, networks and and customers actually paying that you can't learn in a board or uh, you know figure out in discussions. Um, there are just things that are unforeseen that you cannot foresee until you're actually deploying it. And um, and th those sort of things have really helped drive the the technology forward. So one thing that's important uh, to us and to the Internet of Things is security, and uh, we also want to show you how our network is actually architected. So um, we, we have mutual and message authentication. Very important to know that the message is coming from who it says it's from, and that it's also going to the, the, the entity that it's uh, supposed to get to, um, and that the entity that we're um, transmitting to or, or from is, is who they really say they are. So we have strong replay protection, so somebody can't just repeat uh, a message that they recorded over the air and have it actually do what, what it is. So we have replay protection, uh, which is very important for um, secure transmissions. Um, one thing that we offer that is built in, and you'll see where it's built in later, is authenticated firmware downloads. And this is what really helps enable devices to be future-proof. So let's suppose you design a an application and you decide or discover that there may be some sort of security flaw, uh, RPMA allows you to upgrade code over the air, built in without interrupting or disrupting any of the normal communication. And you'll see how that works shortly. And that, that's extremely important. Um, most of the technologies uh, in the LPWA space um, do, just simply do not, do not have that ability. So if there is some sort of flaw or anything, there's your truck roll, there's your ROI out the door, and uh, it's, a, it's a real problem. Um, so we've, we've taken care of that and been using it for, for many years. Of course, we have powerful message encryption, um, nothing that can be brute forced. Uh, some some um, LPWA providers have a very, very, uh, it's called encryption, but it's such a small hash that really it wouldn't take 
uh, it, it wouldn't take more than, than a powerful laptop to, to brute force uh, its way through all the keys. Um, and we also have multicast authentication. So this is a very different problem than, than broadcast authentication, which is what that um, firmware downloads uses is broadcast. Multicasting is to some subset of devices. And it's, it's not the same problem as the broadcast, and it's not the same problem as unicast. Um, and this is one that we're able to, to figure out and do very well. And of course, for our backhaul, we have uh, you know strong SSL and TLS uh, security. And um, uh, throughout the whole network, uh, have taken security very seriously, and uh, you know it's at least cellular grade, if, if not better. So um, many, many heavily regulated industries, utilities, and others have relied on RPMA um, for years, and we we support all sorts of standards. Um, uh, NERC, SIP, cybersecurity framework for critical cyber assets. We got the NIST and the FIPS, and the, and uh, we support uh, NIST. We we, we there are a lot of standards that are very important, and, and we comply with and support them. All right, so our actual transmission model. How does it work, and uh, what's sort of the, what's the magic going on here? So you'll see that uh, um, it's divided up into uh, two slots. We've got our downlink slot and our uplink slot. Um, and a slot is just another word for a PDU. And those are six bytes, but it's, it's flexible, so it actually can be a different size from that. The frame size can change depending on, on the needs of the, um, of the application or the, of the, the customer. Um, and a message is comprised of some number of, of slots. And of course, the order here is important. The fact that the downlink slot comes before the uplink slot uh, is important and helps in the performance and improves the performance. So uh, in each of these slots, you see um, there is the PDU, um, and, and they're all offset. And so in RPMA, which stands for Random Phase Multiple Access, um, we've really uh, embraced the randomness that, that helps make RPMA uh, so powerful in, in wirelessly connecting devices. Um, some of the some examples of that randomness is, are, is AP handoff. So AP meaning access point. Um, handoff between access points, the, the endpoint will connect with the access point with the strongest signal. That's just how it works. Um, and there's there's slight overlap uh, in the way we, we build out our networks for that purpose. Um, but the, the handoff is indeterminate. We don't know at any point which channel will have the best conditions uh, for the, the, the endpoints or which AP will have the best conditions. Um, there's, there's also asynchronous communication, which means that we don't know when the nodes will want to transmit. Right? They determine and they drive when communications begin um, uh, for, for most of the applications. And the endpoints also won't know which spreading factor uh, to use until the time of transmit. Um, the AP, and so therefore the APs won't know either which which spreading factor. And so uh, that's how, and, and um, to uh, deal with that randomness, the endpoints randomly choose chip offsets. So you'll, you'll notice there that D is a, is a chip offset here. And what that means is a, a chip is just a millisecond. And so the PDU is sent, the, the, all the endpoints and APs know that the slot will begin at a given time and end at a given time. Uh, and then a message is sent with some amount of time offset, some chip offset. And each of these at the same spreading factor are sent with just a very, you know, with randomly assigned chip offsets. And the AP will actually demodulate all of them. And we'll see in a minute a bit more about, about that in, in detail. So actually, here it is. Um, so this pictorially represents about 3% of an AP's uplink capacity. So this, this isn't everything. This is just to show in, in one uh, succinct picture how it works generally. Um, so the first step is that the AP will transmit. Remember that's a downlink. Um, and the endpoint determines the spreading factor based on the, the uh, strength of the signal received from the AP. So the APs all send at the same signal strength. And the endpoints can know the difference between, right, they can detect the difference between the received strength and the strength that it was originally sent at. So they know the, the channel conditions. And using that, um, the endpoints then determine um, which spreading factor to use to uh, send, send the message. And then the endpoint randomly selects, so it chooses a spreading factor and then randomly selects a, a subslot, right? So which position uh, in the frame or in, in here to use. So for 512, there are 16 slots to choose from, right? So here's the first four, 
eight, and then there are eight more positions that, that a 512 spreading factor endpoint uh, can use. And for uh, 1K, there are eight, right? And then so here's two, and then it can start here, or here, or here, or here. And then 2K has four, 4K has two slots, and 8K, there is only one slot it can use. Um, and then with it, within each of these slots, all the 512, that uses offsets. So you've got, uh, it, for a given spreading factor, you have many different slots to choose from, and they're randomly chosen. And then within the same, uh, within the same slot, you have those different offsets, and the AP will uh, demodulate across uh, each slot um, for each spreading factor, and then at each chip offset that each uh, slot can have or each spreading factor can have. So that's that's how it goes through. Um, and and so if you think of of the PDU as a as a brick wall. Um, and you look over here, think of this received energy as your wall. And the message, or the PDU, excuse me, is, is comprised of, of tiny, tiny bricks. And bricks, those bricks can be sent either a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, over a short period, or uh, a very few, but over a longer period of time to build up the same amount of received energy. <clears throat> excuse me. And that's how, that's how a message will, will be received, or a PDU will be received, excuse me. Is uh, by using these various spreading factors, but the point is the same amount of energy needs to be received in order for the message to get through, the PDU to get through. So um, our downlink operates a bit differently, and uh, you'll see that there are two channels. There's the unicast channel that's in green there, and then there's the broadcast channel. And uh, the channel conditions here are quite different. So uh, when there's downlink, it's the AP talking to the endpoint. And endpoints are in a very different situation as far as channel conditions go because APs, they're up high. And if you've ever been out on a balcony of a building in a city, it can, if you're not there often, it can be very surprising at how noisy it is. You hear all the street noise. You hear all the noise that's below you uh, because you're up high and open and you have all the sound carries to where you are. But when you're an endpoint, it's you're you're on uh, you're out of that noise. You're not up high. You're usually down ground level, and uh, you can only hear uh, the the things that are just right around you. And so the channel conditions are much better for the endpoint. Um, and so that means that when the AP is sending uh, sending signal down, um, the endpoints typically don't have to compete the same way. So the down the downlink transmit power is actually stronger. You know about a 10 dB. A transmit power increase just simply by the fact that the channel conditions are better. That means that there's 10 times less spreading factor needed. Um, so therefore, the, the unicast spreading factors are actually, they go from 16, that's just 1.6, to uh, 2K. Uh, and most have a good enough link um, that, that uh, you don't have to use the higher spreading factors. So um, that's what's happening here, these unicast things. And so each um, uh, the, the downlink is, is, as you can tell, again, um, time division multiplex uh, with these two dedicated channels. And what happens is the, the first step is the AP optimally packs messages from the buffer, right? has a bunch of messages it wants to send out, uh, and it uses the appropriate spreading factors um, and packs them all in there. And then um, each endpoint then looks for messages with its special coding, right? its gold code, and demodulates all the potential spreading factors. That's what the endpoint does. And then the, the broadcast channel uh, has a, a different approach. So the broadcast channel is stuck at or, or, or stays at the uh, 2K spreading factor. Um, and it has uh, four slots uh, does various things with. And, and um, the first slot or, or that is really it's housekeeping. It's like what the APID is, what time it is, What's the rise over thermal? And that's just the, the channel conditions. And that's what's used later on the uplink by the same endpoints to determine the spreading factor. So that's where that comes in. Um, and also uh, does some authentication and other things. And, and um, the other three slots, um, in, not necessarily in this order, but uh, you know, the second slot is paging. So this, that's for powered applications. And it just lets them know that data is coming. Uh, and then the the third slot does, is the one that's dedicated for code download, right? So, and that's the one that goes to all the endpoints. All the endpoints know this. Um, they all, if there's something in that slot, uh, they will all receive it. Um, 
And then the, the, the final slot is multicast user data. And that's uh, different from the, the, the code download because that's the one that goes to a certain uh, subset of endpoints. So uh, as you can see, this kind of innovation really isn't something that can just be tacked on. Um, it, it's, it's something that can be bolted on later on and has really been honed by, by user applications and by customers in the field. Uh, and, and you can see just by, by this right here that it's something where the, the Phi and the Mac really have to interact quite a bit, and the network itself, right? The network needs to know uh, what's going on, and uh, it, it determines uh, a lot that happens on lower levels, and lower levels are interdependent with the higher levels. So it, you can't just uh, uh, make this, make this uh, nice little tweak um, without changing a, a lot about the technology. So now that we understand the capacity model for RPMA, um, let's talk a little bit about what that gets you. And what that gets you is quite a bit of capacity uh, and orders of magnitude more capacity. Uh, and it, so the innovation really does show in our real, real world performance um, with orders of magnitude greater capacity. And capacity can, should, should really be thought of as the number of messages of a, of a given size um, and the time period or interval at which they are, are sent. Um, and how many can you send? So if you think about, uh, if you break this up into different data models, if you were to send 200 bytes every 15 minutes, uh, one of our access points can send about, have about 23,000 devices using that data model, um, uh, which is uh, orders of magnitude larger than, than other competitors. And, and that continues, 140 12 byte messages a day, one of our access points can, can serve 264,000 uh, devices using that data model. Um, and, and so on. But the point is to really compare apples to apples, capacity is data throughput, which is the number of messages of a given size in a given time interval. And it's not the number of address spaces. Address spaces, it, it, it is not, that does not describe actual real world performance. And it doesn't make sense to use address spaces as a, as a way to compare technologies. Because if you can't serve all those address spaces at a given time, who cares how many there are? Um, so the next point to make is capacity scalability. So the success scenario of any wireless uh, network, uh, public wireless network specifically, uh, is filling the infrastructure to capacity because as you do that, the, all the devices that are connected help pay for that infrastructure. So let's suppose you have a success scenario and um, you have over here on the left, what happens when there's no or limited scalability, right? So you add more access points to try and serve, but if those endpoints are still broadcasting at, say, the same power as before, then it, as you add more APs or access points, the endpoints within that service area will still be heard by the prior access points that the new AP was trying to assist and to um, help support. And so you really just have self-interference. And as you do this, your APs, essentially, their each capacity, the capacity of an AP that has another AP joined nearby the endpoints will cut into the prior AP's capacity, and you can cut it in half. And so what this shows is that there's no way for a network with that kind of technology to scale. Um, however, on the right, you'll see RPMA has the ability to scale. Our endpoints um, have transmit power control, among other things, that enable the scalability. And it's really, this is called cell densification in the cellular world. Um, and without cell densification, without this capacity scalability, you, you cannot have a high performance public IoT network. And uh, this, is, this lack of it is, is how um, like a Sigfox or LoRa, their endpoints are designed, you know, by design, have the inability to, to do that. And so uh, once a network uh, using a technology like those it, it is filled to capacity, they're done. And so if you've got a growth plan uh, for your company and you want to add more endpoints, it, it, it's not possible. And so th this really isn't the, going to fulfill the vision of the Internet of Things. It just, it's not the way to connect tens of billions of devices because if you can't keep adding them linearly uh, and scaling uh, at, any, at any rate, at the rate that endpoints won't join, then you're really not going to be able to support the Internet of Things as it's been envisioned and, and, um, as, and described by analysts, the press, and others. Um, but RPMA has this ability. It scales linearly, which means for each AP, uh, you add, you add the same amount. So if, if an AP can support 100,000 devices at a given uh, data model, the next AP will as well. All right, so 
It also is very important to be able to cover uh, the areas that need to be covered and to do so uh, inexpensively. Um, and this is really described by uh, the coverage area of a, of a certain, of uh, each access point. So one of our access points in an urban environment can cover the same as it would take LoRa to have 18 pieces of infrastructure for LoRa or 70 for Sigfox. Um, and so you can see that uh, of, in, the, in the FCC domains, uh, RPMA really has the most viable path forward for covering um, a nation or um, building a public network that can actually affordably uh, provide connectivity. Um, much less, you know, that's, this is besides just the capacity issues. And even in Europe, we have a, a, a four to one advantage as far as coverage goes. And, um, you know, it, th this is a very big deal and is very important because infrastructure is often the most expensive part of any, any network. Um, all right, so once you have connectivity, what can your devices do when, when they're connected? Well, um, with RPMA, as you can see, they, they will, every single message is acknowledged that's built in, right? Downlink is, is built into our, our technology um, down at, at the file level. So every message is acknowledged. Um, we have firmware downloads without disrupting normal operations. We have packet size flexibility, um, interference robustness with advanced channel coding, intelligent retransmission, um, and, and data rate adaptation, as you, as you saw. Uh, congestion management. This is a really, really um, interesting one. There was a, a great blackout in California back in 2011, and uh, one of our customers also had a, a mesh network. Uh, I think that was before that was you know installed before um, before we were around, and it was down for 72 hours. Uh, basically, these meters were unable to to report, "Hey, I'm out," which is the whole point of having that uh, capability. Um, whereas our our, our uh, connected meters were up the whole time, and they knew exactly which ones were out and weren't um, without any issue. So uh, congestion management was key in that. And of course, we have proven deployments at scale. Uh, we send millions of messages a day, uh, more than 30 commercial deployments. And, and um, you know, it's, it's really our commercial deployments that have helped us make RPMA what it is today. Um, so RPMA, it really is a significant innovation. And it is designed specifically to provide the best and most robust uh, wireless connectivity for IoT devices. Um, and Dr. Viterbi agrees. Uh, and, and, and that's important because, you know, he's someone who his opinion isn't formed lightly and it's certainly not, uh, it, it's certainly not uninformed, right? It is an informed opinion and, uh, you know, we're pleased to have his endorsement as well as those of other industry heavyweights who have been, been around for a long time, who understand the space and who have recognized the value uh, that RPMA offers. So um, we, we appreciate you coming today and, uh, participating in our webinar and we, we look forward to hearing from you and to uh, answering your questions. Thank you so much.